21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskarik. Hey everyone, my name is Steve Weidler. It's, it's just a pleasure to be on the show today. I think a lot of times when entrepreneurs address legal issues, and this included me when I was just focused on having a business, um, the last thing you want to do is speak to the attorney. And it's a combination of that law is very intimidating. Lawyers tend to um, pick up the phone and start recording time the moment that someone calls. Um, and, you know, time is kind of money to attorneys. So the combination of it being intimidating, that it can be very expensive and kind of petty expensive. And that frankly, uh, a lot of growing businesses have a C-suite of a chief marketing officer, maybe a chief technology officer, um, a finance person. Usually that an attorney is not part of your C-suite. And so it's just not a day-to-day -day occurrence and you really feel like, I only need to speak to an attorney because something's wrong. When I started the Emerge Council, I really wanted to get rid of all those connotations. In truth, everyone and every business at some point is going to need legal services and you need legal services to succeed in business as opposed to call an attorney when something or a system or a person is failing and so building that win-win relationship building that that relationship where that attorney becomes almost like your confidant and you can afford that attorney and you know that the prices are predictable and that that person is your trustworthy source to get you from point A to point B, um, that's what I built Emerge Council to be. And it's been a very successful um, endeavor, both professionally and financially. We're here to live for ourselves first. And if in doing that, it helps you. What is your approach? What is the systems-based approach? How do you interact with people? How do you get all information that you need? How do you become part of their team? It, it's very important to understand an entrepreneur and understand what their desires are and what their needs are and build that relationship before you're, you provide um, comprehensive legal services. So many times when I am starting with a relationship with a client, I'm trying to figure out on my dime, um, I'm trying to figure out what their drivers are, what their point A is, where they started, and what their point B is, where they want to end. Many entrepreneurs many times want to end by selling the business or seeing um, some potential um, increase in um, liquid capital, meaning that they cash out. Um, and so then the goal is, is really to figure out how we're going to take legal steps to make that a company attractive to investment or, in, or uh, a pop potential acquirer. But I really have to understand the entrepreneurs, the team. And so I'm not going to usually start any legal project or any legal relationship without understanding the entrepreneur. Now, that's been a fantastic journey for me because many entrepreneurs are are, are way different. I have clients all over the world um, from many different cultures, many different um, companies, very different political views, um, etc. And so um, it's been really fun, part of the practice, to really get to know and understand my clients. At that point, once I know what their goals are, um, I can really probe and see what their needs are. So for example, some clients have a really um, big technology play. So for example, they've written like, maybe they wrote code 
um, for a um, software as a service platform. So I do a lot of technology law based on my background. Um, if they have code that's unique, well, that code needs to be protected. And um, we also have to look at, all right, well, who wrote the code? Is it you? Is it your independent contractors or is it employees? Was it done overseas, meaning outside the United States? Was it done here in the United States? There's a whole bunch of questions. And based on those questions, we can kind of figure out, well, what, what should we do here? Um, what can, should we pursue copyright protection? Um, should we uh, have better agreements with the independent contractors? Um, what, what really is appropriate? And we kind of plot that all together in a plan. Once I, we go through that process and can kind of get it uh, mapped out, we can then really flat be um, like the cost for filing a trademark. It's, it's pretty low cost and very cost effective. And we have system um, based approaches um, because we know, all right, this is, this is what needs to be done. And we've spent enough time building the relationship where we can be really efficient in, in getting that work done. And so it's a kind of, the first step again is a, is a combination of getting to know the client, which we always offer um, brief consults um, to really spend time to, to get to know um, the entrepreneurs we're, we're working with. The second step is to really map out what the strategy is. And then the third is to implement using um, mostly flat rate processes. Of course, the exception is as an attorney, we're experts at dealing with conflict and um, having to sometimes threaten to sue people and really getting helping clients get out of conflicts or or deal with conflicts. Frankly, there's no real passive approach to that. And that is, you know, something that um, sometimes I don't cherish, but my role as an attorney is also to um, deal with adversarial situations. And that, you know, is very difficult to the flat fee because we don't know what the other side is going to um, bring up. Um, so in in that case, we have a, um, a very deep bench of experts, litigation experts all over the, the world um, that as part of a relationship that I'm with, um, IR Global is an international law group that I'm involved in. Um, and so I have resources, again, all over the world to, to really find value-added um, litigators who help me resolve issue, whatever issue happens. So in the case of litigation, we're really looking for value and to really spend the least amount of money to get the best possible. How did your experience as a senior attorney for a Fortune 50 a tech company shape your approach? And how do you see technology transforming the legal landscape, particularly in the areas of intellectual property and business asset protection that you spoke about? Sure, those are really good questions. Um, as you referred to, I cut my teeth um, in kind of big law, um, working for a Fortune 50 company, which was AT&T. Um, so the technology was pretty complex. It was the beginning of um, um, a packet transfer or what, how we get data on the internet as opposed to telephone wire. Um, and so the experience really gave me exposure to extremely smart um people and really big plays in technology, like multi-billion dollar um, plays that I had to really boil down and explain to um, to uh, regulators and whoever needed to know. And so that experience was phenomenal for me to really say, all right, well, I'm doing this for large, a very large company, but there's other technology plays, there's other, any kind of play that um, needs to be broken down and explained, which is is, but not to another lawyer, to potentially an investor or a um, 
a stakeholder or um, it, it, there's just so many, or even to the entrepreneur himself, like here, here's the technology you have, here's what to play it. And so how I got that experience was even more fundamental to my growth. When at t got bought, um, I got an exit package. As part of the exit package, um, I decided to start my own predictive analytics organization. And um, what we did is we, I licensed some technology from the University of Wisconsin. And our play was that we went into school districts and through a combination of assessment and predictive analytics, we were able to determine which kids would potentially drop out or not do well in school long before they were um, in high school. And so the the theory was that the school district could then spend the resources effectively on the students that weren't dropping out. That was an eight year journey. Um, I took it from conception of idea all the way to my exit. Um, I faced the good, the bad, the ugly. The good was I grew the company. The bad was um, I had to raise. It was business to government, which means that the cash flow um, is really a difficult aspect of any business where you're selling to government. Um, so that was a bad part of the business. So we were either doing really well or we were cash poor. And so I had to raise a lot of money. And in raising a lot of money, I diluted myself out of my um, my entrepreneurial endeavor. And so I've gone through really good times and rocky times as, as being an entrepreneur. So the combination of really working for a large organization and knowing how that operates um, and then, you know, starting my own thing, which didn't have any operations. <laughs> it just, I did it all. Um, really putting those together or amalgamizing them made them um, really tangible on what, on my business goal for this law firm, which is to make sure that every entrepreneur, anyone with a vision or a dream um, and a will to get it done and use really sophisticated techniques. And that gets um, and to get from point A to point B. And that is where the technology comes in. Um, in the 21st century, when I started this law firm, I knew that there was technology out there and that lawyers are going to be the worst at first mover technology. They're just not, we're not trained to be. We're very legal training. And I have business training too. This is why I can say this is legal training is very, um, conservative it's very like well that's a risk like why would i start on a system that's a risk you know i'm risk we're very risk adverse generally um and so bringing a platform to technology um is not something that a lot of attorneys are going to jump into right away i realize that you know people are putting billions of dollars into crms which is customer relations management um this companies like thomson reuters with their practical law product there is we can get just as much information, just as quality um, uh, technology as a large comprehensive law firm billing out at $1,000, $2,000 an hour. Um, and so including um, a lot of information about international um, laws and international plays. And so the, through the combination of building good networks and using technology, I feel like I can operate as a very sophisticated law practice be much more system space than a, say, a large comprehensive law firm, and frankly, do just as good work and build that personal relationship. Because again, I'm taking, I'm using technology, um, all at a lower price point than a large comprehensive law firm. So that's been a really good way for me. Don't be afraid of the dark. Be careful with stars. Not every light is gonna guide you, baby. Keep it close to your heart All of the pressure's gonna drive you crazy Cause you rise to the madness In the morning it's all gonna vanish Don't be afraid of the time When the cash flow or when you have accounts receivable problems or something Thinking about those at t days was great um, Like you, you have dreams like how great this was um, and even before that, I've always worked in large organizations. So I would work for Congress. Um, after that, I was a prosecutor at a, in Miami. Uh, the law office, I think, was 400 prosecutors. So I always felt like, a, I don't know. I never thought about being in a small organization. I always thought you can do more 
if you work in bigger, more sophisticated things. That's what I was always taught in school. Um, and I just never doubted it. Um, the problem with large organizations I found is if they're not necessarily created to get the job done. Um, so I and my clients will attest to this. I talk to the client and I know that there's things that need to be done to make that organization better. I'm not going to do any more and I'm not going to do any less than my best possible approach to get the job done. In a large organization, the job is to stay in your lane. And every time I got out of my lane to try and solve the situation, um, I got not in trouble like, Steve, you, you, you don't know what you're doing. It's like, Steve, this is a really large organization. Your job is to show up at this hearing and explain the position and someone else whose job it is exclusively to do this is gonna is gonna do that and so especially when we were working with large governments i would get calls from um basically government and elected officials um saying hey can you come and help me with this because you seem to know what you're doing and i want you to explain you know what's going on with this uh packet switching you guys are doing so you know try and get permission to get on a plane and go to wherever you know lincoln nebraska or something um and um, they'd be like, well, Steve, someone else has to do that. So I'd have to call the official and be like, well, you know, someone else. They're like, well, I know that someone else. I don't want that someone, someone you to come up here. And so it just was always like this battle, like the right thing, if you were an entrepreneur, you'd be like, if they just called you, you get on a plane and you, it, it, that's great, um, employee A. I'm so glad you have that relationship. Take the credit card, take them out to dinner, do whatever you need to do. In a large organization, no, that's not, there's too many internal, there's too much internal clumsiness um, that that is, it, it, um, it doesn't work that way. And it took me years and years and years to figure that out. And um, I, I found myself getting kind of discouraged um, because again, I'm not gonna change my mentality. And I think my, my, my mentality is, is that I'm a more entrepreneurial. Whereas now, uh, sometimes, and especially as I get older, honestly, I don't feel like I'm, like there's anything that I've never seen. Um, you know, I see people die, I don't know, like maybe you just get older and that's how life is. Um, so it's not like I have anxiety on that. Um, I just, and I feel like every circumstance that I've, um, people have brought up or goals that they want to reach, I can help them get there. Um, but I think, you know, that is the uncomfortable side of, of the entrepreneurial journey is like, you know, sometimes, especially when I raised that last round of money in my company, um, my last company, I I remember saying to myself, I don't think this is going to end well. And I'm just letting go of these sales. Like, and like physically have a, had a, or a mentally had a, a um, like a mind flash of sales just being let go in the wind and let go in the wind. And I can't tell you how awful it was the moment I let go of the sales, but I knew I was doing it. It was an intentional move. The sales let go and it just was torture ever since um, in that company. And so that's not something that you usually um, have at a large company. You have a lot of other issues, like, um, but that's not an issue I'll ever re-experience having worked for a large organization. So the idea for an entrepreneur is to get that balance and it gets back to, you know, what I'm here to do as an attorney, which is to just really help them um, see that, you know, the sun is going to rise. Yes, like it's going to rise. And this problem that we're having is very doable legally. And I can talk about all your problems. I have this confidentiality. I'm not probably not going to meet the people that you even are telling me about. Um, but we're going to we're going to come up with a solution that's going to get your your issues either never happening are taken care of and protect you as the entrepreneur and your entrepreneurial organization. Thanks, bros, and I'm grinding. All these lights are blinding. I wonder is it worth it? Feel like I'm losing my mind. Yeah, remind me. Let's continue in the, the in in the direction of small companies, new companies, startups. So 
there are some key l- legal challenges that startups often overlook. How can they best navigate them? I think that looking at things legally is no different than when you're gonna, you have a nice piece of land and you need to build a house. So you're an entrepreneur, unless you're a distressed entrepreneur, is not going to start a business not thinking that it's going to change the world or, or um, be successful at least. And so then the question is, well, what kind of foundation does that person need to build? So um, I've had, I've cheaped out in times of my life where the foundation absolutely sucked and then I had to knock down the foundation and start over again. The same holds true with law. So the, the basic thing is to look at the entity formation and what you're trying to do with it. Now that can be really overwhelming and for a lot of people and um, or they can watch YouTube and think that, you know, there's someone saying, well, you know, just start an LLC, um, uh, an American LLC, start in Delaware because that's where all the laws. All right, well, that was, that's just fill out forms. That's no strategy. We don't know why you're like, what's, what's your future? Do you think you're going to need to raise money? Do you think um, you're going to sell this business? Do you think it's going to hold inventory? Do you think um, it's going to hold a bunch of IP assets and intellectual property assets? Well, we have to know all those questions first, which is, again, why I'm doing the, um, getting to know the client to figure out, well, what is it? You know, how does this house going to look? And Or how do you envision this house ultimately looking? Then we can backtrack and figure out easily, like in a millisecond for me, I can figure out what the entity is and where it should be. Or is it going to be a foreign entity, um, you know, which again, easy enough, but we have to figure out what that foundation is going to look like. Then how we build up on it is usually a periodic review. Um, So we need to, everyone needs a trademark, like a trademark protects a brand. So unless you invented, I always say this, unless you invented the cure for cancer, um, well, they're not going to need who cares what the brand experience is? You take the pill or the injection and you get cured from cancer. Who cares what the name is? Who cares if you get sick for five days after? It cures cancer. None of my clients have the cure for cancer. So everyone else has to have a brand experience. Um, and so we come to your podcast. We know that there's going to be a certain look and feel to it. We know that there's going to be a, a certain element and that hopefully the guests, including me, are going to be relatively interested. So, um, so that's your brand experience. And so we have to protect that brand experience. That's a given. So a lot of times it's a name of a product or it's the logo, but it can be sounds. It's the whole kind of looking at what it is and protecting that in the countries that matter. So some of my clients are, for example, from um, have Chinese, um, they're importing from China, they're e-commerce um, focused and they're importing from China. Well, then you have to protect that brand in China, because that's where your manufacturer is, and in the United States. So again, we're already at the point, beginning of the business, that every business is a little different. And quickly, we can figure out what, what to do on that piece. And we offer, it's called Total TM. It's a um, flat fee, relatively inexpensive, using a lot of technology package for that. Um, you know, the other things are, well, maybe you're going to come out of the gate with something that is an invention. Well, we have to protect that invention before we get it out of the gate. That's through something called a patent. And so um, a combination of, you know, looking at the intellectual property, looking at the business, looking at the physical assets, there's real estate, which a lot of times most of my clients are operating companies and they're leasing, they're not, it's not a real estate play, but, um, you know, we have to look at what all those assets are and then come up with protection strategies. So again, and maybe it's a partnership, maybe they're like, and, you know, I think about this a lot, every partnership, almost every marriage starts out good. Like, why would you, otherwise, why would you do it? And the marriages end in, you know, 50% divorce. Um, but I think businesses are worse. So, you know, and the the rules, the laws are not construed like you would in, at least in American divorce, where it's like, there's a statute, you just follow the statute. And in a, in a business divorce, this is all very uncertain. So you want to make those things certain at the very beginning and assume that the that this might not always work out. That doesn't, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but those are all things that you do at the very, at the beginning or during the the infancy of the business. Now, I realize that a lot of my clients are um, 
early stage. And so then we have to balance what their needs are with what, what their business is. Plus, I have to build up the trust. Like, again, I can't tell you how important to me and to most of my clients, the relationship is and the um, types of discussions that we have or what they confide in me, partially because I think I earn it. Um, but part of it is attorneys in general, We our lips have to be sealed. Like we could lose our, our bar license, um, which is kind of a big deal in my profession um, if you you know, spill the beans. And so things um, that sometimes even it would be appropriate for like a counselor, um, like a psychological counselor, um, that these are the types of things. But what I like about that relationship is we're the separate channel. Again, you're going to have CC suite meetings and you're going to deal with people like all day. These are your team. This is, But teams have issues or, you know, that doesn't mean you're going to tell well, gosh, I think don't think the company's going to do well this quarter. You know, you might tell one or two people, but you tell the whole C-suite, you might not have a C-suite. So um, it's really important and really sacrificing the relationship that attorneys should have, um, especially business attorneys with their um, continuing clients. And so um, that's, you know, the nature of my practice. And it's, again, it, it can become really rewarding. Again, I think the challenge is, is that a lot of people have never really worked with an attorney or they've had bad experiences just because, and you know, I'm not, I'm going to be honest, the, uh, the connotation of an attorney isn't a pleasant one. <laughs> so you have to overcome that, that, um, but I think that's true because how we're portrayed on TV and there are some jerks out there and that's my job that don't worry about that as a, as a, a client, that's my job to do with all that. And I'm good at that. Let's immerse a little bit more into that part of your work where you use both soft skills and hard skills. So you spoke about drivers at the beginning of our conversation. Then you spoke about trust. You spoke about distressed entrepreneur. It's very unique and interesting combination. It's a very interesting pyramid you have. If you can share a little bit more about your, your specific approach, technology and human, uh, technology, both technology and human empathy. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, I So to tell a little story on, on the soft skills of practicing law, I was a prosecutor in, in Miami, and that's how I started. So I was 26 years old. And um, from suburban Milwaukee, Wisconsin. And um, I never really had the experience seeing how much poverty and how diverse the world really is um, until I became a prosecutor and dealt with people that were shot, people that shot the people that were shot, people that were drug meals. Um, people that were pushed out of their countries. Um, I was really dealing with a uh, socioeconomic class that I, I never experienced before. And I had to quickly establish what the case was and uh, be able to not only explain it, but pretty much give them um, comfort um, at, at a day that justice was supposed to be done. Um, that could be a whole huge debate on whether justice is really done. and. But that building those skills was excruciatingly difficult for me. Um, but it's a combination of you have to listen and you have to put yourself in what happens if you are that person and um, what would you do and how would you react and really hit those those spots. Because a lot of times it'd be like, they come down, they got shot, the person will get probation or something. And you have to explain, you know, they're thinking the person's going to go to jail for life. Um, and you have to explain, you know, justice really is a relative term or the case got, you know, continued or thrown out and really trying to explain really difficult things. Um, meaning you and I would, I, I don't know how you feel, but, you know, if my relative were shot or if I were shot, I don't think I'd be particularly... I'm happy with the, the situations I had to explain to them. 
or or advocate for them. So the combination of doing that and doing a lot of them really quickly, um, it really helped me build like a tremendous amount of um, soft skills to the point where like someone going bankrupt, which I hope I don't have to deal with very often, but or you know something going really wrong is all relative. And and even when I lost my business, the sun rises, um, and it's really easy to be both empathetic and and firm. Now. One thing attorneys have to do, though, is zealously represent them, their clients. So zealous representation means a bunch of things. You have to study the law. And so I was just on vacation in Miami, and um, everyone is reading a book. I'm reading the analysis of IP law over 2023. Well, it wasn't the, but, you know, I'm into it. It's okay, but I would have rather been reading a novel. But you have, the point is, a good attorney has to stand top of the law. So we have to be very studious. Um, that was a skill I had to build, too. I was a good student. I think I'm pretty bright. But you you want someone that's really astute um, and, and studious. The second thing is, you have to advocate for your client. And a lot of um, people are, no one likes conflict. Like, it's not like I cherish my 2 o'clock call that I'm going to have this afternoon where I'm going to have to fight with an attorney. But I look at it, I'm like, my client is not putting up with it. They're not going to keep the money in escrow for for the next 12 months where um, they need the money now. And we tried to explain this to you recently, and now we're going to have to do something about it. And so um, it goes from, but those, again, it's kind of a combination of you have to listen to the other side. You have to be as polite as possible. Um, you have to you know, not raise your temper. But at times, that zealous advocacy. Sometimes you do have to get... Um, get ruffled, your feathers ruffled up, just like if you're a surgeon, sometimes you have to save someone's life. You're not thinking about what you're having for lunch at that point. You're thinking about how am I going to save this life? And I feel like at certain points, zealous advocacy requires that I'm going to, if I'm taking on a client, I'm going to um, be as zealous as possible in representing their rights. But, you know, understand that sometimes they're like, well, why don't you go? And, and sometimes it's like, because that's not going to work. And so it's a combination of the soft skills and really you know, being incredibly passionate about the work I do and um, being extremely professional and building a solid reputation that um, are going to get um, the job done for my clients. Um, I think attorneys are very, including me, um, the moment we get a case, we're going to look at, well, who is this attorney? Like, where did they go to law school? Um, did they ever write anything? Um who are their normal clients? And is this someone that, and if you see like, man, I mean, that doesn't mean they're not gonna be smart or a good attorney, but we form our opinions on who we're dealing with very quickly. Um, and usually the, the point is well put. Some attorneys just don't do that work. And, um, you know, doesn't mean they're not zealous. It just means they're not well-rounded. And so that's how I look at it. And it's been really interesting for me coming in from um, the business world um, where, because uh, this can be such a narrow skill set, but working holistically is a very broad skill set. And so everything I do is holistic, which makes it really fun. Um, otherwise, I'd probably be doing something else if I wasn't having fun with it. I don't want just anybody. I hope the audience can see I'm very passionate about the work I do. Um, the the question I think I always um, ask myself is, is the work I do the entire part of my life? Is it my being? Is my existence? I think it's really important. Um, now, again, I'm getting older. It's really important um, to, to look at that. And I think um, you you have to like what you do um, because it it's a big part of my day. Um, I also think that there's a lot of other things that have definitely stimulated me over the years. I love to travel and meet new people. 
And so um, I built a, a big part of my law firm is is really focused on international um, work. Uh, so I, I can travel. Um, I also really love music. And so I have some musicians as, as clients. Um, I've lately really enjoyed learning about competitive sports. Like, so our team, the Denver Nuggets, is um, in the NBA Finals. And no one thought they were going to get there. Um, Denver is not New York City, um, but it's it's nice. And if you guys ever come in, coffee or lunch is on me. But the um, the point is, is uh, watching a resilient team and watching this team, and I went to like 30 games or something, um, watching this team get to the finals has been really like an incredible experience on learning about human resilience. Like I have a team um, from near Croatia, um, Jokic from Serbia. Um, but anyway, the point is, is I, there's some other things in life that are fascinating. Balancing that on my interpersonal side, I'm really working on on routine. And so I'm, I'm really focused a lot on the uh, social emotional side of me um, and journaling and making sure that I have a routine. Um, I love to work out. I'm right now doing some kickboxing and, and hit classes. I'm a very passionate skier. I like to push boundaries when it comes to my sports. And so really kind of balancing my life, making sure that I have a routine, that making sure, because if I don't have a routine, um, what I found, and this this is later in life, honestly, that I get anxiety because it's like, I'm doing these things, but I'm not point on hand. I have all these things going on in my mind. And if I can channel that and get this down to routine and journal, um, I'm really much happier and much more focused on segmenting the time that I'm going to be spending on my work and my my um, clients, as opposed to the time I'm spending with my family, which is the most important. And then to do the things I want to do in life. Again, because I've been fortunate enough to travel a lot. I've also seen a lot of the world. And um, I, I really have had a different understanding of the world than I did when I started traveling. I love building relationships and I can't emphasize enough how important it is for me to get to know potential clients and see if we have some things that we can build together, me acting as your counselor and confidant. Um, so I offer free consults. It could be no question or a question that's been lingering on um, anyone's mind. And um, all you have to do is is uh, go to my website, which is www.emerge, E-M-E-R-G-E, console, C-O-U-N-S-E-L.com and click um, scheduling free initial console. Um, and I am glad to spend some time with you, break some virtual bread, because most of my clients are not in Denver. Um, and so we kind of break bread and talk about what what's on their mind. If you have an immediate um, situation, please call me. Um, anyway, the and it's and or email me. It's S W E I G L E R at emergeconsult.com. So there's many ways to get in touch with me. There's also ways to see, you know, who I am. Um, I'm really big on LinkedIn. I blog all the time. Um, and so I look forward to getting to know your listeners and no question is too dumb. You're never too small. You just have to have the will to succeed. Um, also, if the issue is complex, that's where I'm glad to spend time unwinding it for you and trying to figure out if I'm the right service provider. Plus I have a huge network of both lawyers, accountants, sometimes psychologists um, to help you get through the problem. The thing to avoid is don't disregard this area um, of, of business. Um, 
it's really hard once you build the bad foundation. So I'm glad to talk to you at any stage um, and don't feel like any situation you're bringing is too screwed up or too basic. 21st Century Entrepreneurship with Martin Piskorik.